Good morning, church. Well, it's another nice Sunday out, actually. Uh, I'm just very blessed to be with you all this morning. I'm blessed to be a part of this family, this flock that God has given us. Um, and if you haven't noticed by the... Is it on? There it goes. If you haven't noticed by the scripture reading already, this morning I want to be talking about our shepherd, who is Jesus. Um, how many of you have read the book Animal Farm? Mm -hmm. We often, I remember reading Animal Farm in school, and it was talking about how people will blindly follow those who show a little more power, a little more charisma, and they will just blindly follow after them, even if they're taking them to their death. What about the term sheeple? You heard that before? I usually hear it right around politics time. <laughs> Both sides use it. But it's a derogatory term for people who will ignorantly follow whatever everyone else is doing. In scripture, we see this too. The book of Colossians warns against this. If you go to Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 8, it reads, See that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. See, in the church, we also have a goal and we have a focus. And the world wants us to pull, be pulled away from that. They want to pull us away. In John 10, 11, he reads, or Jesus says, that he is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And I hope just from that passage there, we can see that Jesus sees himself as sheep, which in some ways is, you know, a little offensive. Because sheep, for lack of a better term, are stubborn, and sheep are stupid. So when Jesus is like, you're the sheep, I, I kind of take that a little personally. I know I can be stubborn at times, be a little hard-headed. Oh, no, I'm not. And don't ask my wife. She'll agree with me. Jesus sees himself as the sheep, or himself as the shepherd, and we are the sheep. So what does this mean for you and I? What does it mean for you and I to be sheep? See, this morning I want to take a look at several verses as we discuss what it means for us to be the sheep and for Jesus to be our shepherd. It's my hope that we can answer the following questions as we go through our study this morning. Do we hear the voice of the shepherd calling? Do we follow where the he leads? And do we recognize, do we realize what the shepherd has sacrificed for his sheep? Or as in the verse in Colossians says, are we following, are we listening to whatever catches our fancy? So first point this morning, the shepherd's voice. If you're still with me in the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, it reads, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, at the time that Jesus was saying this, the Jews would have had a very intimate knowledge of shepherding. After all, David had written Psalm 23 about the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What else do we know? David was a shepherd for a time. So was Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all shepherds and all a part of their history and their culture. Some of the prophets also spoke about leaders of Israel and Judah being shepherds, but often ones that have failed. We see this in Jeremiah, in Zechariah, in Isaiah, and in the book of Ezekiel. However, when you get to Ezekiel in the 34th chapter, there's also a prophecy about a shepherd who was coming who would lead over the people of God. 
and take care of them. So even before we get into the voice of the shepherd, the Jews would have had an understanding that there was going to be the shepherd coming who would lead them again. But what is the purpose of a shepherd? Pretty self-explanatory. To tend the sheep. Yes, that is correct, but it goes much deeper than that. Because a shepherd, to be able to take care of the sheep, had to have an intimate knowledge and understanding of his sheep. It's what we see there in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. The sheep know his voice because he has spent so much time with them. They knew the voice of the shepherd. They understood what he said versus what anyone else said. It said they would flee from the stranger's voice because they did not know it. You and I still have the voice of the shepherd today. We still have the word of God with us today. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. It is not enough to just hear the voice. It is not enough to just read his word. There is an action required from the sheep. When the shepherd calls them, he doesn't expect them to go, blah, okay, I'm done. He expects them to follow. It's not enough to just listen to the voice. There is an action that is required from the sheep. It's not enough to just know the voice, but it's to know the shepherd. There is a relationship there that is more than surface level. The shepherd has been with the sheep so long that they know him just by his voice. They know him by his mannerisms, the little twitches, ticks that we don't even pay attention to ourselves. They know that. They know him by his smell because he has been around them for so long. Even if there was one to disguise themselves as the good shepherd, let's say he breaks in and steals his clothing, the sheep would still recognize that it's not their shepherd. What does that mean? Well, that means in our own lives, we need to be close to Christ. We need to know when there is someone or something that is coming, claiming something contrary to the shepherd's words. Even if it comes in the same manner, I would hope if I said something that was against what the shepherd said, you would call me out on it because that's what is required of the sheep. Let's go back a couple chapters. John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Go down a little further. Verse 47. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Well, that's a little scary. Do I know the shepherd's voice? Do I recognize when it's him calling me, when he's talking to me? Or am I just paying attention to whatever catches my fancy? Do we know his word well enough that when someone else is speaking contrary to it or twisting it, that we recognize it? Because Jesus says that those who wish to steal the sheep, there's the robber who tries and comes in by the other way to take us away from our shepherd for their own purpose. We know that we have an enemy. What, how does Peter describe the enemy? He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. There is danger if we are not paying attention to the shepherd. There are also those who mislead, as the voices that the sheep did not know or spoke contrary to the shepherd. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20 reads, Beware of false prophets who come to you in what? in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits, the false prophets, and the fruit of their labor. You know, he goes into trees and fruit, but where does he start? In sheep's clothing. So what I'm really trying to stress here is, do we know the shepherd's voice? Or are we so distracted by everything around us that we don't know exactly which voice to follow? Let's see, we're at about 11.25, so we're, we're probably about halftime for the Seahawks game, right? Somewhere around there. 
You know, for a long time, that was my distraction. I had to watch football every Sunday. And I kind of now want to check my phone. Thankfully, I left it over there, so I can't check it. <laughs> but are we so distracted by everything around us that we don't know exactly which voice to follow? If we are to be the sheep and follow after the shepherd, we need to know him so well that when he speaks, we know his voice. And not only that we know it, but we are compelled to follow after it. If we are his sheep, he knows us. Do we know him? And if we know him, then there is that response after he calls. Not just to hear him, but to follow him. Why? Because he is a shepherd who leads. Going back to John chapter 10, verse 4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. He doesn't just send them out. It says he goes before them. The shepherd, the good shepherd, the one who leads, he does not send the sheep somewhere that he has not been or would not be willing to go himself. He is a leader by example, not just in word, but in deed. And I know I already mentioned this, but we're going to turn there anyways. Psalm 23. And a lot of us could probably quote this by heart because we've heard it since we were two or three years old. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 4. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. I guess I could stop there. I, I don't think I need to talk anymore about a shepherd. That passage sums it up well. I, this passage can sum up everything that needs to be said about a shepherd who leads. A shepherd that makes sure that he not only knows the needs of the sheep, but what does he do? He doesn't just know his sheep, he leads them to places where he can provide for them. He knows what they need and provides for those needs as well. Where else does he take them? He takes the sheep to a place of rest, of safety, and of refuge. A place that provides everything for the sheep in a secure location away from the predator. And what else does he do in just these four verses? He seeks to restore the health of the sheep. Okay, I'm still talking about sheep. What does that mean for us? God knows, Jesus knows, the Spirit knows exactly what we need. The things that we bring before him and the things that we don't bring before him the things we openly confess to him, and the things that are too deep for us to even understand. The shepherd has a plan for us if we are willing to follow him. He leads us out. Even when we are feeling the weight of sin, even when we are feeling guilty and ashamed of the things we have done in our lives, the shepherd still seeks to lead us. He still seeks to bring us to a place of restoration. The idea of pastures green, he wants to nourish us. Now, I'm not going to go out and eat grass in a field. But what is God asking for us? What is Jesus wanting for us? He wants to restore our soul. Even when we feel all the weight of sin and guilt, he still looks to restore us if we are willing to follow after him. The great pastures green, he bringing to us to a place where we can be spiritually filled. But it's not just to spiritually fill us. It's not to have a nice snack. He is leading us there to complete restoration, a place of safety with quiet waters to restore the heart, the mind, the body, and the soul. We also see in this passage here in Psalm 23, that he is leading us in righteousness. Another way to put that, 
he, it says for his name's sake, but another way of righteousness is the right way. He is leading us towards the right way, the right path to follow. And he's going before us. He's not telling us to go do something he wouldn't be willing to do himself. He came here and died on a cross. There's, he knows everything about us. He wants us to follow him in the way that he designed. And we've been talking with the teens. We've been going through uh, kind of a crash course on the celebrations of discipline. And I've been talking about the idea of meditating on scripture, meditating on what God has done for you. And one of the passages we've been going over is Jesus calming the storm because there's so much that happens in there. But you know what all of them came up with? That life's going to be messy. Life's going to be hard. But we have to focus on Christ. We have to focus on God. And if we do that, we can get through most things in life. Most things. We can get through everything in life if we're focused on Christ. But he doesn't want us sitting in the storms. He wants, us, he wants to lead us towards pastures green, quiet waters. But those things will happen. And he is faithful to us if we are willing to follow after him. Finally, in verse 4 there, he has a rod and staff to protect us from the things around us and, if need be, to correct us when we go astray. How many of you have ever actually watched like a shepherd work? I, I, I watched a couple clips of um, some of the hills like in Ireland and Scotland when they're, when they're dealing with the sheep. And their rod and staff isn't there just in case something else comes. Sometimes it's to smack the sheep back into, into fold. Why? Because sheep are stupid and stubborn. And sometimes they need to get a quick reminder to come back to the safety of the shepherd. In the same way, there's sometimes we need to be corrected. There's times I need to be corrected. He's the good shepherd. Like I said, Psalm 23, we could just stop there for the day. And I think it would cover everything that needs to be said. But Isaiah 41.10, still along this idea of the shepherd who leads, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We have the good shepherd in Jesus, and we have the creator of the universe who says he will strengthen and uplift. That's so encouraging for me, because... Like a sheep, I can be stubborn. And I need someone who's going to be able to help me even when I don't know what I need for myself. So here in these passages, you see... Ooh. What? Okay, I don't know where that came from, but... I'm awake. Here in these passages, we have seen how the shepherd leads. It is loving the sheep and caring for them if they are trusting and following after him. But even though the shepherd is leading, there's still dangers, there's toils, and there's snares that are around us. I've heard people talk about, you know, once you go out the doors, you're in the mission field. And that's true. But you know what else happens when you go out those doors? You're in the battlefield. There's a war going on. It says for our souls. There are still dangers and toils and snares that are around us, that are around sheep. So a shepherd must be ready to protect the sheep and, if need be, to sacrifice his own well-being. A good shepherd is one who the sheep listen to. A good shepherd is one who leads by example. But a good shepherd is the one who sacrifices. Going back to John 10, I'm going to spend most of the day in John. I am the good shepherd... I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock, one shepherd. 
For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life for the sheep, that I may take it up again. He is the good shepherd. Why? Because he lays down his life for the sheep. He sacrifices for the sheep. Along the idea of sheep are stubborn, sheep are really weak. You will never see sheep carrying a pack on their back. Other animals are good for carrying things, but not the sheep. They were not meant to carry a heavy load. In fact, under a heavy load, they would be crushed by the weighty burden. This is another reason I think God compares us to the sheep. We are not able to carry the burdens on our own. In fact, we are supposed to give him the heavy load so he can carry it for us. Psalm 55, 22 reads, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He is the good shepherd. He sacrifices. He carries our burdens. And I know you used a picture from the Passion. But when we really go into the science of Christ's death, he suffered the most horrible thing imaginable, even before he got to the cross. And that picture kind of reminds me of it. How about another verse? Let's go Isaiah 53, verses 5 through 6. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was suffocating for our transgressions. He was drowning on air, basically, for lack of a better term. As he hung there, he had to pull himself up as the tendons are being torn in his wrists to try and just get a gasp of air. Why? Because he sacrifices for you and me. And he did it willingly. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He was willing to sacrifice. That's the mark of a good shepherd. One who, no matter what dangers or toils are coming around the sheep, laying his life down for them. The hired hand had said, please, because he has no, he has no value in the sheep. They're not his. The shepherd cares deeply for the sheep and is willing to sacrifice for him. 1 Peter 22-25, through 25, I won't read all of this, but the, the crux of it is, you were like straying like sheep, but now you have been returned to God. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7, again, I won't read all this, but we call that the, the love chapter. Love is these things. And if you go through all of the things that love is, those are the characteristics of a shepherd, of the father and of the son. It is the characteristics that we should also have. Why? John 3, 16 through 17. I always add 17 on because everyone seems to know 16. But we kind of, you should stop right there instead of going all the way to 17. For God did what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He's the good shepherd because he sacrificed. In fact, because he sacrificed, he's the only one worthy to be called the good shepherd, I would say. But in these passages, I hope you're not seeing just the love and sacrifice that Jesus had for us. 
but I hope you also see the importance of following after him and knowing his voice. It's not just about punching our ticket in on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, Bible class or a small group. It's about knowing our creator, our God, our savior intimately. Now, the other great thing is we have all of his words right here. We're able to know what he wants from us. We're able to be directed because he has left everything for us. We don't blindly follow him like uh, Animal Farm or Sheeple. I, I don't like using that term. It just feels weird. We don't blindly follow because we have his word and we should know it. We don't blindly follow after him because we know and understand all that he has done for us. And if he is our good shepherd, we're willing to listen to him. See, now at this time, we're going to have the invitation. Whether to become like a sheep and follow after him, to follow after the good shepherd, or to come forward with a burden, with, to come forward with a need, to come forward with prayer. That's why we're here. I know we use the term the flock, but we are here to support and lift up one another. That's also what the invitation time is for, whether to follow closer to him or maybe to follow him for the first time. But my challenge to you this morning is this. Do you know Christ's voice? Do you know the shepherd's voice? I'm challenging the teens to do this, and I'm going to challenge you as well. Spend time in prayer. We saw Jesus got up early before daylight dawned to spend time with his Father. Spend time in prayer, in reading the word and meditating on the he has given us so that we can follow after him. And I want to ask you, if you're doing that, what is Jesus calling to you now? Can you hear him calling you? It is my own prayer that he will make his way bright and clear to you. So this morning, as we get ready to stand and sing, let us follow the shepherd that has loved so much, given so much, given everything for the sheep that are you and I. If there is any need that should be made known this morning, once you make it known as we stand and sing.